Let us pray. May God's word be spoken and God's word heard. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please be seated? Well, what a delight it is for me to be back with all of you at the Church of the Transfiguration this morning. Uh, It's been a long time. We were chatting before the service today, and I think the last time I was here uh, was during the pandemic, but I think it was September of 2020 when we were gathering out on the hill, and that's over two years ago. So it feels like it has been a long time, and I guess it has, Um, because of the various uh, shutdowns and reopenings over the past few years. I actually haven't been here since you arrived, Michael, so that's one of the joyful things about being with you today. And since then, I also know uh, that David and Anne, Young, others uh, have joined the team. Deb is still here, uh, as she was when I was here last. Uh, And with your church wardens, uh, David and Patty, with whom I have worked over the past few years, but although a little bit more behind the scenes, I know that your parish is poised to do amazing things as we continue to reopen at this stage of the pandemic. Michael, the other day, shared with me some material from Transfig the Hill, and uh, I just want to say I think your plan to refocus your mission and write a new chapter in the history of this place is so exciting, and I commend you and your leadership for taking this on. Well, here we are in the, on the second Sunday in the season of Advent, the second Sunday in a new church year. And as I looked at the readings for today, those wonderful Advent readings that we have before us every year, um, I got thinking about a story that I heard a couple of years ago now. Perhaps you've heard it as well. It's a story about a Navy submarine that was stuck on the bottom of the harbor of New York City during World War II. It seemed that all the hope was lost. There was no electricity. The oxygen was quickly running out. And in one last attempt to rescue the sailors from their steel coffin at the bottom of the harbor, the U.S. Navy sent a ship equipped with divers to the spot on the surface directly above the disabled submarine. A Navy diver went over the side of the ship in one last attempt for a rescue. And the trapped sailors down below in the sub heard the metal clang of the boots on the hull of the sub, and they moved in the submarine to where they thought the diver was, just outside the hull. In darkness, they tapped in Morse code. Is there any hope? The diver on the outside, recognizing their message and knowing Morse code, signaled by tapping back on the exterior of the sub, yes, there is hope and the sailors erupted in cheers of joy. Is there any hope? That's the question that is posed in the season of Advent. Is there any hope? And each year on the second Sunday of Advent, the response to that question comes from a rather unlikely place. Not someone riding in to save the day, but rather from the wild and eccentric preacher and prophet, John the Baptist. He does not tap in Morse code so that everyone erupts in joy. Rather, his hopeful response feels more like rain on the parade. Just when we want to really start focusing on what's going to be happening in Bethlehem and the baby Jesus, maybe perhaps the next Christmas wine and cheese party or the office gift exchange, out comes John the Baptist to seemingly crash the party. You brood of vipers, he says, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. And then he continues, even now the axe is lying at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not bear fruit, good fruit, is going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. And he's not done yet. You, he says, you children of Abraham, you think you've got it all in the bag because your great ancestor was chummy with God. But I tell you that God is able to raise up children of Abraham 
from just a few dusty stones. God can find other people too. So, those of you who think you're all right because the past is yours, you're going to get a big surprise. Wake up. Examine your heart now. Scrutinize your actions now. See how you come up short in your fidelity to God. Repent is what John says. Repent. Now, I think the message of repentance is hard. It was then for the Pharisees and Sadducees who stood by the riverside. It is for us now because repentance is more than just remorse. Repentance is not just about feeling badly for what we have said or done. Repentance actually calls for change. And aren't we quick to point out everything out there that needs to change? This week, I was reading the summary report from the recent COP27 climate change conference in Egypt, and it reminded me of something that we all already know but would probably like to forget, that even the most Herculean efforts by entire governments and the world's biggest industries may not be enough to reverse climate change. We've already done too much damage. Closer to home, this coming Tuesday, just two days from now, marks the 33rd anniversary of the murder of 14 women at L'Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal. The anniversary of the massacre of women is a grim reminder to us each year of our need to repent for the ways in which women have been victimized. The way of violence is never the way of the coming of the Lord, whom John announced. We know that. And when we look a little further afield, beyond our borders, over in Europe, the Russian invasion of Ukraine seems to have gained new steam in the past weeks. People are shivering without power as winter sets in. We see human rights violations in Qatar as they host the World Cup. So many reasons to wring our hands with anxiety. The anti-Semitic remarks over the past two weeks by political leaders and celebrities, that must be pointed out, that must be called out clearly and consistently. And yet, with this litany of all the ways in which the world has gone wrong and is going wrong, John the Baptist is not standing in the corridors of power and pointing at elites and those from out there somewhere. He's not preaching at the Colosseum in Rome or at the temple in Jerusalem. He is standing knee-deep in a muddy river, speaking to ordinary folks like you and me. His call for a 180-degree change in direction is not directed at tower or temple. In fact, the axe lies at the root of each and every tree. The call to repentance doesn't lie out there somewhere where it's easy to be an armchair critic or an outraged bystander. It lies here, at the root of each heart. For us, in Advent, there is no more obfuscation, no passing the buck, no pointing fingers elsewhere. The call for what the Greeks call metanoia, the conversion of the heart, repentance begins here with us. Now, to their credit, the crowds who listened to John that day at the riverbank seemed to get it. In our own time, we would probably write off John as some wild eccentric who wandered in from the wilderness and didn't dress very well or eat normal things. He's not the kind of person that you probably want to invite to your Christmas party. It would have been easy to move to the other side of the sidewalk, as it were, and just keep on going. And yet, in response to John's preaching that day, the crowd wanted to know, so what should we do? John's response, as it is recorded in Luke's gospel, was action-centered. He said, if you have two coats, share with someone who has none. Same with your food. Turning to a tax collector standing nearby, John says, don't overcollect from other people. 
To the soldiers, he says, don't extort money from others and be satisfied with what you have. This is what true repentance looks like. It actually means changing ourselves in order to change the world. In words that would later be attributed to Mahatma Gandhi, be the change you wish to see in the world. Repentance leads to action. And this is good news. This is good news. The change begins here. That we do have agency. That we are empowered by God to make a difference in God's name. The seeds of the coming kingdom of God don't lie out there somewhere in a world outside of our control. They lie right here with us. John is the voice calling for repentance. But you know, John's voice is not only about repentance. We know from his life and ministry that he is also the clarion for the coming of Jesus. Remember that lovely story of the visitation of Mary to her cousin Elizabeth, both of them pregnant. When Elizabeth hears her cousin's greeting as Mary enters the house, the child within Elizabeth's womb, that is John the Baptist, leaps at the sound of the mother of his Lord. Thus, even before John the Baptist was born, he was already testifying to the presence of Jesus in his life. And then, many years later, in the story recounted in the first chapter of John's Gospel, John the Baptist sees Jesus coming toward him and declares, Behold, the Lamb of God. Is that not also our task? Is that not also our vocation? Not only repentance, but pointing others to the presence of Christ. Behold, the Lamb of God, to know Christ and to make Christ known. So, John's call calls the people to repentance, and he also announces the presence of Jesus in the world. But there is one more way that we hear John's voice in the pages of the gospel. Do you remember the story near the end of his life as he is languishing in King Herod's prison? John the Baptist sends his own disciples to go and ask Jesus, Are you the one who is to come? Or are we to wait for another? Now, it might seem so strange to us that after boldly announcing the presence of Jesus and baptizing Jesus in the River Jordan and hearing that booming voice from heaven, this is my son, my beloved, listen to him, it might seem strange now that John would be expressing such doubts. Jesus, are you the one? Perhaps that's what prison did to John, as it does probably for those who are incarcerated today, those who have lost hope. John had time, too much time probably, to let the seeds of doubt and discouragement take root. So Jesus sends John's disciples back to see him in prison. Go and tell John what you see and hear. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The sick are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to new life, and the good news is preached to the poor. In other words, Jesus is saying, yes, John, I am the one. Do not lose hope. Now, we know that John never saw the light of freedom again. In that rather gruesome account recorded in John's Gospel, John was executed in prison and his head placed on a platter for all of Herod's dinner guests to see. And yet, before he died, John heard the transformation that Jesus had brought. I cannot help but think he was buoyed by that news as it was brought to him in that prison. The blind see, the deaf here, the dead are raised. Good news is preached. The kingdom of God is emerging, perhaps gradually, but relentlessly, just as the sun rises each morning. So on this second Sunday of Advent, John becomes an example for us as someone who is able to find hope in the midst of despair. Here at the Church of the Transfiguration, 
I wonder today, how might you, as a community, be the agents of hope in your own time? You have such an amazing history of doing that. I only know the recent history of this parish, but it is one of bringing hope to the church and the world. But as we look to the future, and not just remember that we are children of Abraham in the past, as we look to the future, with everything else going on around us, how might we point to the new dawn that is breaking forth even now, through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus? John the Baptist, whom we remember today, called for repentance. He also pointed to the presence of Jesus, and he asked questions that called forth good news in hard times. Is this not also our call in this Advent season, and in fact every day? And is John's ministry one that we can inhabit as we catch a vision for God's call upon this community here and now? May the Lord, who has drawn together this community of faith, who continues to draw together this community, sustain and strengthen you for this sacred task. And this task is nothing less than partnership in the transformation of the world. With John the Baptist, prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare the way of the Lord. Amen.